Hello, welcome back to the YouTube channel. I just want to say thank you to those who have subscribed to my um, videos and have clicked the alarm bell to keep notified of my most recent videos and for obviously families and friends who have supported the video. It really means a lot to have somebody support my YouTube channel, you know. All I say is that please continue doing so, share the videos, make sure all your friends have it as well. You will always find somebody who will be very interested in this video. I want to say that this video will be very different from the other ones because, you know, normally I sit down and I I do a little bit of talking but I mostly spend the time just playing some music and just kind of going through the method. Well, this time we'll be going through the method but we will also be going through the thought process behind my artwork. Especially because my artwork has taken a very existentialist turn. If you look at most of my work, it's very surrealistic in a way of, not like, for example, Savile or Dali realistic but it's very kind of looking at ex existentialism. So I wanted to kind of explain this in this video. So this will kind of be more like a podcast, and I will release a podcast version of this, where I look into series a bit more deeper, it'll be a bit longer, it'll be more of something you listen to as opposed to watch. It will probably double the length of this video. But it's, anyway, it's a little bit about what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about what I'm doing now in this video. And hopefully you guys will look at this and think, oh my days, this is amazing. This video will go through my thought processes. So you will see that for the start, it starts off with me drawing like three thing, three people in this video and me like setting up a nice perspective kind of layout. But then I end up drawing one person over an idea that I would develop on, that I have been developing on for a while without even thinking about it to win this review. But I will continue to develop on this idea of kind of extensionism and serialism. So as you see, I'm just going to catch you guys up in the video feed. I have created an axis, I've created a nice line on the cross, and I've just decided, or I will just decide, I'll draw five circles. And this is your proportion of your body height, you know? Like, in theory, your body should be five heads tall, right? And with these five heads, what we do is we draw lines to create a kind of perspective. Now again, it's a bit annoying because I spent so much time on this perspective and just not to use it. But it's still something very good I like to explain in my video as perspective is perspective is very important in artwork. It's something that I'm developing myself as a skill. As as an artist, for you to really I say as well, it's a very helpful skill as it really adds realism into your artwork. Like it adds that kind of again, like I was talking about last episode about believing like the belief that this is real, this does this, as it's an interaction between your artwork, the kind of shapes that you're making in your artwork, and the environment that it's in. Yeah? So I cannot stress further how important this is. It is very important. Okay? So anyway, we've created this nice perspective using the lines. We used straight, I didn't draw these lines out. I just used the, um, straight line the straight line tool and then yeah we draw the five circles for proportion as that's something else that's very important for believability and i just see we draw three five circles for three figures and these figures have decided to be very figurative indeed like they're very um abstract figures you know like you know they're not like their faces they're going to be people but I'm not going to add a lot of detail into this. And this is part of the kind of existentialism theme, you know? Like, I wanted some of my artwork to be abstract, but yet yeah, serialistic. Um, I, got, I don't know if I started this idea of existentialism back when I'd done my... Um, back when I did my first drawing video on the drawing tablet. And I had the big eye, and I had the... Um, you know, the stars in the background. And I thought this was about how... <laughs> it's hard to explain. But, you know, I thought about what I communicated with friends. Friends said, for example, was how we let love lead us. And that's understandable, you know, because a lot of our love comes from our mouth. And, you know, we kiss, we talk, we send compliments, like I love you and everything. But I was more thinking about how we see ourselves. You know, like, our existence is based on how we see ourselves at the end of the day. Like, if you see yourself as an intelligent person, in theory anyway, you do end up kind of self-prophesizing almost the idea of you being an intelligent person. 
and you start to try and shape your dialect around being intelligent, you shape your behaviours around being intelligent, you shape the way you look around being intelligent, you know? So this was kind of the idea, to put the eye right in where the mouth should be, and just kind of, I didn't extend the mouth, I kind of just like to say, like, I kind of just made the eye the main kind of face, you know? Also, you know, it's kind of this idea that we are what we look at and what we absorb. So that was kind of the first one, the first kind of drawing that I put on YouTube, right? That was a long 45 minute video that, oh my gosh, I'm just saying, I'm so thankful that you guys sit there and you, you know, <laughs> looked into it, you, you watched it because Jesus Christ, I'm not sure if I could have watched a 45 minute long video. The second video I put on YouTube was a I tell you, it was a bit shorter, and it was less to do with existentialism, you know, it was just more of me demonstrating the skill that I had and me looking at proportions. But this one here will focus, will kind of push me back into the same realistic kind of artwork. And if you don't follow my Instagram, please follow it, j.williamsartstudio. And this, in this kind of Instagram, you actually see that I kind of a lot of the artwork that I put on there is, you know, about viewing, kind of my view of self, you know, like kind of my kind of thought process about myself and how I see myself, you know, and there's a lot of drawings on like me kind of picking up the planet, for instance, and these, these are self-portraits, like even this right now, for me, as you see towards the end of the film, not, maybe not now, but towards the end of it, you see that this is a self-portrait, this is how I People think self-portraits is you drawing your face. A self-portrait isn't that. A self-portrait is you projecting yourself in your artwork. Like this is the purest projection of you in your artwork. And this is what this is. And when you see the kind of end process of the drawing, you'll realise that this is this, this shows this. this. I'll explain to you how I, why I feel this way and how I believe it links to... This is like the best portrayal of how I see the world. That's what a self-portrait is. And you see this a lot in surrealism why something may not necessarily look like a self-portrait. It might not look like it, but it is that. It is a self-portrait. <laughs> I did say this is going to be me waffling. Like, this episode in particular is more of a podcast than it is a video or me explaining my scale. But I will explain very quickly what's going on here. Well, again, as I said, these background kind of images are not used. I'm just kind of making sure that the proportions line up to perspective, right? And it's very important as these kind of background figures are in theory the same height as the figure that I'm just drawing out now at the front of the picture, in theory. But we've got to create the illusion that they're the same size but they're also behind it. That there's a distance between the front figure and the back figure. So I do this by just simply, you know, drawing these lines here, we follow them as a guide, right? So everything's in line with this. And because they're in line in a certain way, it means that when we draw them smaller, they don't look smaller to the viewer. In fact, they're interacting with the kind of environment, the, the drawing in such a way that it looks like this person here is the same. The, the draw is like we've almost drawn them as if they're the same length, same height, but really they're not. But because it looks that way, it gives the illusion of them being distanced, as if they're fading away into the background. That's the word I'm looking for. And as they fade away in the background, they get smaller. They don't look smaller than this front figure. They just look further away. And this is something that's important to learn in art because it makes your artwork look more realistic, as I was saying to, before. It's the interaction of the 3D world. It's it kind of moving across this three-dimensional level of space. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wish I kind of just done this, done this drawing at first and thought, I'm going to draw just one of these figures. Like, I'm going to add loads of details to one of these figures. And with this, I'm going to add meaning. But I didn't. I decided to just go with this anime. Another reason of this is because in my um, sketchbook, I practiced, in my A-level sketchbook, I practiced perspective from all the drawings that I was doing. 
and it was really important for me to kind of practice it. So this is kind of how I practiced. This is really helpful to practice in this sort of way. I am using those drawing dolls. They are the ones that you look at for like proportions when you're drawing bodies. This is what I'm referencing, hence they look kind of like, hence the front one in particular looks more like the figure dolls. I don't know if I, this is why, I mean this process of me drawing all over the three proportion lines of, of what I kind of created was kind of me choosing the best one to use as like a main, for like the main focus of the picture, like which one am I going to use? As you see I choose the front one, you see later on in the video, I choose the front one to add the detail and colour into, and then, well, I have about the other ones. Anyway, from now I'm going to be a bit quiet because I've waffled on a lot and droned on about surrealism. I'll pop back up in like, I don't know, five minutes. It'll be silent though. I think the music was a bit like, it was a bit enough. I think sometimes it's cool, other times it's not. I run out of tracks to background into the, the, um, the video as well. Copyright as well, obviously. These are not my tracks, these are just my favourite artists. If you want my playlist though, they are also available in my usual channel. You see the most sort of songs that I play a lot. So if you are interested in the music that I listen to for whatever reason, just click on my own profile and you just scroll down and you see playlists. You see a playlist that I've made for art with my all my drawings. And you see a revision for sociology, because I do sociology, and you also see my playlist. As you can see, I know it's a five minutes, but a key stage started popping up in my um, video. It was like five minutes though. I say that was like a three minute, you know, silence. I've always lived in a video though. I silence after like two minutes gets a bit awkward. So, you know, you should really thank me because I, don't, I can't imagine a um, three or four minute silence in a video, in our video without any music or nothing. Part of the reason why I put on the, the music in the background. Anyway, what I start doing now is just choosing the colour. I choose a brown because this, I want this to kind of be like a persistence of like a wood kind of colour. So brown was the colour I chose. I don't create a wood texture as such. And as you see as I colour move in, I feel as if there is an intellectual reason behind that. Probably because I want this to be surrealistic, but surrealistic doesn't mean ultra realistic. Well, it does, but it does, it's not, it's hard to explain with surrealism. Surrealism is very five dimensional artwork. Like, if you look at like Salvador Dali's artwork in particular, 
it's not extremely realistic, it's so realistic. Like if you complain it to like an extreme realistic work and a surrealistic work, you realize that this, the extremely realistic is more realistic than the surrealistic, right? But the con it's about the concept behind the surrealistic work. So for example, Salvador Dali's Persistence of Memory, these may think of a good name for this piece of work that I'm doing. Once it's finished, I'll tell you the name of the work. The persistence of measuring that has melting clocks in it, right? And you tend to find the background is very flat. I know a lot of people go, oh, no, it's not that, because they don't want to insult the artwork. But I'm not insulting the artwork by saying that. In fact, from those of research, I think mean, the background is flat for a very good reason, but I will go into a big explanation of that on another video. Maybe on more of my pod, another kind of more podcast kind of video thing that I do. But the background's very flat, right? And this is to represent, very briefly, it's meant to represent how time has more dimension to, has more dimension than pretty much anything we experience. Hence, the mountain clocks are very 3D. What I'd like you to do is, if you didn't get what I'm saying, rewind the video, pause it, and search the persistence of memory on Google. Look at the image, and then play the video as I talk. And maybe you will understand what I mean when I say, when I say this, right? So as I said, the clocks are more three-dimensional than the background. They're more three-dimensional than almost every item in the drawing, in the painting, sorry. Hence, you know, you could argue that time is more real than anything. So anyway, as I was saying, the concept he's looking at is more real than the extra real this piece of art artwork being like, I don't know, a extremely real drawing of a face, right? Ironically, the concept that he's looking at is just more real. Like, time, for instance, is just more real than us. And that's the whole point of the artwork, you know, to kind of highlight how time has an impact on mental reality and physical reality, hence it's melting like cheese. And he refers to it in these, actually, in these kind of, like, communication of the artwork, of explaining the meaning of it. Well, not really explaining, but giving us hints. And he's like... The clocks are like cheese, like camber, camberbert cheese, it's like a French cheese. And that's what kind of the reference to, like the clocks melting like cheese, you know? But these have more impact on time and space and mental reality and physical reality than we do. Hence, it's even having a, a mental reality in our memory. And this is kind of the thought process. See, I told you, I'm talking about the thought process behind this. This is the thought process going behind this when I'm looking at how I develop this further because you know as you see later on it changes from what was meant to be three kind of dolls to just one doll alone in space by itself with all these colors in the background but we'll get to that i will explain that don't worry we've got like 13 minutes after this video or whatever so i will explain it 13 or 30 i'm not that long <laughs> but yeah if you're interested in this series really and it's good to look up i tend to find that if you look deep into it, you are going to get lost. Like, you'll be placed in an existential crisis. Like, you'll probably be questioned. You'll be looking into philosophy. That's what happened to me. Now, I looked into Soviet artworks. I got lost in the meanings and the philosophy behind it. Hence, I ended up looking into platonic existence and... Um, what's the idea called again? Emanations. There's kind of a lot that I looked into. It's why I wrote like a GCSE, uh, not GCSE, it's why I wrote like an essay on it because it was so deep I had to write about it. But again, it's highly interesting. Like, you know, I feel as if looking in philosophy it really makes me kind of realise how much we don't really think about stuff how we used to, you know. But yeah, I'm not going to waffle about philosophy as I don't say, well, hey, welcome to my philosophy channel. I say, hey, welcome to my YouTube channel because it's about artwork, not philosophy. But maybe it's be part of a podcast, I don't know. <laughs> so this is weird. Now, as I say on my last video, opacity is very important when you're colouring in. So what I did in this video is I um, used black pen, but I made it very, very, very opaque. Like we're talking, the percentage of opacity is like 12%, right? I could decrease it very low. And this is to kind of add tone into the, the, the drawing and as I said before one thing that's very important in drawing is tone if you don't have tone 
it decreases the interaction this item has of the 3D world, right? Like, because there is a light in the 3D world, right? Always going to be light. And with that, there's going to be shadow. And there's going to be darker areas. And if you don't have this, then your object is just shapes. It's just shapes together. They're 2D shapes and they kind of lack a meaning. I'm not sure aiming to do 2D shapes. <laughs> Interesting. But unless you're aiming to do 2D shapes, then you, these are just shapes that are flat and two-dimensional. But I don't get me wrong, I have nothing against 2D shapes in art. Some of the great artists use 2D shapes, but I tend to find their artworks are very abstractive, if you know what I mean. Abstract, abstract, abstractive. You know, you just make up your own words. Their artworks are very abstract. <laughs> Whilst in here, we're being abstract, but we're being more illustrative abstract. Like, we want people to have some sort of believability in this. Like, even though, for example, this is very, um, this in itself is an idea that's very abstract and very kind of, you know, outworldly, it's still an idea I want somebody to look at and think, oh, damn, that could be me. And this is what I'm doing by adding the tone, adding the um, kind of 3D shapes, you know what I mean? Like, this isn't just a random collection of shapes either. This is a person. Like, this is a, you got to remember, like, these are like the type of dolls that are used for proportionality by artists all the time to draw people. If anything, these have, like, these dolls have a lot of, due to their kind of proportionality, they have a lot of their... <laughs> It's hard to explain, they have kind of like a humanity to them that most objects don't have. That's the best way to explain it. Obviously, humans have more humanity to them than, you know, these dolls have. Like, the humans have more humanity than these dolls have. But, they still have a very humanity kind of thing about them. Like, artists use, comic book artists a lot use these to kind of draw movements, you know. And it inspires them to create characters just of this kind of inanimate object. But it still has emotion, it still has feeling, because... You can create the motion to put the feeling on there, which is quite interesting. This thought kind of led me to kind of, when I was thinking about what am I going to do with this drawing, the first thing I thought was how this object, this enamel object, is what artists like us use to create our characters, you know. Like Spider-Man, you know, started off as sketches of these, like multiple sketches of these, doing poses like, you know, you know what I mean, like he's swinging poses or punch poses, you know, and the same with the Hulk, same with Iron Man, right? And what the artists, what they did is they projected their ideas, their thoughts onto this, like the free will that the characters experiences in the comic book, the thoughts, the feelings, the fights, the risk they feel, the pain, is all pretty much what the comic book artist is feeling and thinking and creating all emanated onto this, right? And it's starting to make me think about us, right? And how we were created by God, right? We were created by God and we were given these this free will, right? Like we were given the free will to feel, think, do, move around and me having, <laughs> I've given enough free will to have this conversation with you right now through YouTube, or if I do decide to make this a podcast, which I think I definitely will, so I'm just going to say this is a podcast, so that when it becomes a podcast, there isn't this, well this guy said this will become a podcast, right, it is a podcast already, it is a podcast, but I was given the free will to do this, right, but at the same time, like how Spider-Man, for instance, was created from this doll, which is inanimate. It doesn't have any feelings or free will yet until I, until Stan Lee projected his will onto it, is how, for example, I don't really have any free will unless God projects his will onto me. So do I actually have free will? Is this, again, we're going through my existential crisis here. So you might get bored, but you might actually find this very interesting. I want you to kind of think about this for when you're doing your pieces of work, if I have any fellow artists on here. And, you know, what I thought about is how, is my free will actually my free will, or if it's God's will for me to have free will, and for how I need to use my free will, you know? And 
is something we take for granted. It's something that we don't think about when we move around and we interact with our peers, you know, or when we're out in parties getting completely stoned or drunk, right? But free will, are we actually free? Like when you're drunk, for example, or when you're stoned or whatever you want to call it, you don't really have control of your actions. You just do, right? Like it's a classic example of you not having any control of yourself. So you just do what, whatever the alcohol, for instance, let's just say, tells you what to do. So that's not free will. Your free will has been taken away from you. And we know this, hence we hopefully think, oh, I don't really want to get drunk, you know, I don't want to drink. But then we don't think that our free will is going to get taken in real life. We don't think about how we are sometimes placed in circumstances that we might have zero to no control over. Like, really, for example, like, let's say you're walking around, like, the street, just mind your own business, and, I don't know, it's actually a pretty hard example, I think it's pretty hard to find an example of this, because I don't think we're even programmed to think like this. But let's say you bump into somebody, right, and they get very angry at you. In the heat of the moment, you decide that you have to shout back. But why did you have to shout back at this person? Why didn't you just, I don't know, can't think of a nice calm way of talking this out but is it because you decided that like you thought this through and decided that was the best way to go through or because in the heat of the moment you let what was ever pulling your strings decide that's the best way to go through this you know and it's a crazy kind of thought you know it's hard to really put through on a youtube channel as such i tend to find this of like things that i write about but then i suppose talking about this is a kind of what gives a meaning to my artwork like you look at this what i'm doing right now with all the stars i think what the hell are you doing like why is he putting stars <laughs> you know what i mean like what is his thought process behind this i think nothing but i suppose this kind of episode is kind of i made it so that you understand the thought process behind my art my artwork <laughs> and yeah it is a little bit crazy that's it. it goes way into the depths of free will and by the fact that that's what your artwork's meant to do. And, you know, I think hopefully one thing you've taken from this video is that that's how you should be thinking in artwork. You should be thinking far-fetched. And, in fact, artists before me, well, I'm not really an artist yet, but let's say serious artists way before my time, the ones that I study, like Salvador Dali and others, thought like this too. They thought about how their free will and how their actions kind of led to the creation of our artwork and it led to kind of a lot in that artwork like there was another artist who done the um if you type the temptation of saint anthony that's it the temptation of saint anthony i think of the name for weeks and i couldn't find the name you tend to find that why he was doing this he was on opium if you, if you don't know what opium is in short opium was like the 18th century version of weed. Like this was the most common drug you would find. And people smoked this all the time, right? But while he was doing this painting, that's what he was on, right? And he probably had no control over his actions whatsoever. But he curated that through God knows what and what he was thinking, right? But this is the type of stuff that people did back in the day, you know, when they were doing their artwork. And this was their surrealist artwork because at the end of the day, it was their most crazy thoughts put onto paper. And this has continued with some of the Dali's work, even though you kind of think so a bit more. And the more recent artist, um, Michelle Bascal, I can never pronounce his name right. I think he's yeah, Michelle Michael Bascal, right? No, sorry, his name is Jean Bascal, right? And he, again, was, he, was, he was a heroine of this. Like, he kept on taking heroin when he was doing his artwork and he wasn't in control of his actions. But he created these crazy pieces of work that were just so expressional because of, because of that, you know? And anyway, this is kind of, now that I've waffled on for a bit, this is kind of me leading on to my final piece of work, right? And one thing I wanted to talk about was how I kind of wanted to create that, kind of like a pan-dimensionality of my work, right? Like I wanted it to be pan-dimensional, right? And what I mean by pan-dimensional is something that isn't really limited to the conventional kind of dimensions. So when we look at this, as you can see, we have these like strings going from the puppet, right? And they're going up and towards like up. 
and what I thought about when I was thinking about it was kind of like what I spoke about before. Remember I was thinking about Plato, I'm not sure if you remember, kind of at the beginning of the video. Well, Plato had this idea that we are emanations, right? An emanation is like an imperfect copy of what's going on, let's say, a piece of artwork, right? So, like, Greek, here's actually a very good example. Greek stone sculptures, they used to have a mould. They used to have one mould where they used to, like, have their sculpture. And this used to be the perfect mould. And this used, this was, like, when they made their sculpture, they used to put it into this mould. And that would be the one true sculpture. And when it was moulded, they would make loads of different sculptures from this. So this is why you see, like, this kind of perfect copy around, like, buildings and around, like, Greek architecture. That's how they did it. They kind of made one perfect copy, then they moulded it and made loads of different copies. And these would be called emanations, right? In a way, like, Socrates, another philosopher, said the sun did this too. It made loads of its little star copies and sent it down to Earth. And this is how we see. Like, the sun sends its light down to Earth, and then we see, we see the sun... But we don't see the actual sun, we see the emanation of the sun, right? And this made me think about how, for example, maybe we're imperfect copies of something. And we're being controlled. And whatever happens up there, we do the exact same thing. You know, hence we've got these strings kind of like connecting this, you know, doll to higher forces. This doll is me. I know it sounds crazy and people are like, what? You think you're not, you have no free will? I think, well, maybe I don't. I don't know. But this doll is me, and it's kind of like me, kind of. This is kind of when I'm talking about this now, this is kind of what I was thinking when I was doing this, right? Hence, this video as well is so free. Like, this is my first take of the video. I really wanted to, this to be fresh from my mind as opposed to it being like something that I think about and script, and it's like two weeks from now. I want this to be free. I want this to kind of be kind of something that just flows out of my mind as I'm kind of going over the kind of work that I've done and thinking about it. But yeah, this is kind of the idea I want to put, you know, emanations and the idea that we don't really have any free will because really what's going on down here is what's going on, like, two-dimensional planes above us. And we're just this emanation. We are just protect this, we're this projection of somebody else's will, as I said, you know. We're the projection of somebody else's will, their character and their feelings. That's kind of my theory. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm right. I don't know. But that's just kind of how what was going through my head as I was doing this artwork. And what I want you to get from this video is, number one, I talk a lot and I like to waffle. You know, I get told this a lot. I go on and on and on and I confuse myself sometimes. I probably think that you probably are be confused with this. But what I want you to get from this was really intriguing. What I want you to get from this is the thought process behind artwork. It is a wrong, confusing thought process. And this is the normal thought process of how my Instagram videos, no, my Instagram pictures, my YouTube videos, and my YouTube artworks, but I don't display it. And this will happen once in a while, you know, where I sit down and just talk about my, the ideas that flow through my head as I do my artwork. You know, I'll sit down and I'll draw and I'll be like, I did this, this, and this. And watching this video took a whole hour. Well, no, sorry, the drawing took like a whole hour and a half. And so I didn't want to maybe record as a drew it as I think oh there's a YouTube video it's an hour long so I cut it down to 30 minutes and I spoke up the major points literally after I did the drawing but thank you for watching hope you enjoyed it hope you didn't get bored after hearing my voice and I can't get bored after hearing my voice and yeah enjoy I think down the link below will be I think there'll be a big square that will be like my um YouTube video previous, the previous YouTube video, and the YouTube video after that, which I'm going to pump into one big playlist for you guys, especially for the new subscribers. And then for new people who have just come across this video, it'll be like a nice little circle kind of thing with like um, a profile picture. Click that and you can subscribe to my channel. Anyway, thank you for listening. Have a nice kind of evening or day or whatever time you're watching this. See you guys another time.